Father, tonight we praise you because you are an awesome God. You are worthy of our praise, our adoration. You are worthy of our gratitude and our love. And tonight we want to say thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us from our sins. Thank you for, for pursuing us when we lived in rebellion. And so tonight we praise you for the mercy that we find in Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray that as we give ourselves to you as living sacrifices, that we would hear your voice, that we would have the courage and the faith to follow you wherever you lead us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Matthew chapter 26, Gospel of Matthew chapter 26. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. There's some in the pews around you, and you just take one of those, grab one of those, turn to page uh, 1,000 and, let me find it, 1,059, and you'll find Matthew 26. We're going to be looking at a couple other passages as well tonight. While you're finding that, uh, let me tell you about something that is really exciting to me, and I hope it's exciting to you, but it's, uh, it's called LHC for Kids. Uh, Calvary is, you maybe read about this uh, last Tuesday in the, the paper, local paper, they had an article about uh, what we're doing to champion our public schools in our community. And some of you are going, why are we championing the public schools? We have a great private school here called Calvary Christian Academy. And that's true, we do. But we're not just uh, about our school. We're about partnering with our community to try and bless all of the children of Lake Havasu and all of the teachers of Lake Havasu so that they have the resources to invest in the kids. So uh, we've been partnering with Lake Havasu Public Schools for a long time, uh, blessing them, helping them in a lot of different ways. And this year, we decided to see if we could not expand our influence and invite the community to join with us in supporting our schools. And, uh, and so our goal is uh, to raise $60,000 for our public elementary schools, 10000 for each elementary school in our community. And Calvary started off by putting in the first $1,000 for each school. And we are inviting uh, everyone in the community to help us support this. So if, uh, I want to invite you to help in several ways. First of all, if you've got a child or a grandchild uh, at a public school, if you've got a teacher that you know, a friend uh, at a public school, then I'm going to encourage you to uh, materially support. It doesn't have to be a lot. Just if all of us do a little something, uh, we'll get to the goal easily. And you can go to the website. that's there in the bulletin. You can take it, check it out, lhc4kids.com. And you can give through the website to the school that you want. You can see their needs list that they shared with us uh, of the things they will spend the money on. And, uh, and you can donate to them. So uh, first of all, if you care about the kids in the community, then do that. You give something. You know, it doesn't have to be much. Secondly, please, if you're on social media, share on Facebook. Do whatever you can to get the word out so that people know. Because this is about the, the, as many people knowing about it as possible and then supporting it that way. And, uh, and so and then take uh, those bulletins and tell your friends and neighbors about it that aren't on social media. So uh, put it in their hands and say, hey, go to this website and, and help us have great schools so that we can help our kids have a great education. And, and by the way, we're doing this because we care about our community. We care about our kids and our families in our community. We care about our teachers in this community. And we care about leading men and women, boys and girls, to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. And we believe that all those things are going to be accomplished by this LHC for Kids. This is not just about Calvary doing this. This is about Calvary challenging Lake Havasu City to step up to the plate and support our schools individually. So that said, uh, I hope you'll be excited about it. Check out the website. Uh, if nothing else, go on to it and watch the video of Julie. So, uh, <laughs> hey, you can't, can't get enough Julie, can you? So, uh, so check that out. Hey, uh, we are concluding our Persons of Interest series tonight, and we're doing it by looking at a man who just might be the best-known Bible character not named Jesus. We're talking about the Apostle Peter, and uh, he's our person of interest today, and Apostle Peter was a, a follower of Jesus Christ. He was a fisherman by trade. He was a firebrand by personality, and he's the first person who ever confessed Jesus as the Christ. Jesus was talking to the disciples, and he said, who do men say that I am? And after they answered him, he said, who do you say that I am? And Peter goes, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. 
Peter was also the, the one out of the 12 who got out of the boat when Jesus was walking on the water. Uh, you know, if you don't know the story, then check it out in the Gospels. But Peter is, is uh, in the boat. All of them are in the boat and they're crossing. And Jesus comes walking on the water and they freaked out, thought he was a ghost. Jesus said, don't be afraid, it's me. And Peter said, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, all right, get out of the boat and come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on water, at least for a few steps, <laughs> before he took his eyes off Jesus and panicked and started sinking. And, and so, you know, he was that guy. He was a leader in the early church. We know this about Peter. In fact, there's so much uh, in the Gospels about Peter, we can't look at it all. So tonight what I want to do is I want to look in on three moments in Peter's life. Three snapshots, if you will. I guess in today's language, it'd be like three Instagram posts uh, and uh, of just moments in his life that we can learn something about Peter and, and the process of how God worked in his life so that we can understand him and we can understand ourselves a little bit better. Uh, so as we look in on Peter's life, uh, I want to challenge you with this question today. As we look at Peter, uh, I want you to figure out which pic picture of Peter's life best describes where you are in your life right now. We begin by looking in at Peter's failure. Peter's failure. Matthew 26. We're going to pick up in verse 69 in just a moment. Here's the background. Jesus has gathered the, the 12. He celebrated the Passover with them, instituted the Last Supper, uh, and told them that they would uh, abandon him, deny him, betray him, all that kind of stuff. Peter says, Never do it. I'm gonna, I'll be there with you to the end. I will never deny you, even if I have to die with you. Uh, Jesus tells him he's wrong, prophesies his uh, denial, and uh, they leave. They go to the garden. Jesus is arrested, uh, and uh, that's where the story picks up. Verse 69, Matthew chapter 26, page 1059, if you've got a Bible like mine. Now, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, you also were with Jesus, the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Um, this is a picture of failure. It's a picture of stick your foot in your mouth, eat your words, Egg on the face, total and complete failure. Peter goes from promising Jesus, I will never deny you, even if I have to die for you, to cowering before a servant girl. So have you ever been there? Have you ever declared your allegiance to Jesus? You've been on fire. You've been committed. You said, hey, Jesus, I'm going to follow you no matter what. I'm going to be faithful to you. I'm going to serve you with my life. I repent of all that junk I've been doing. In fact, I will never, ever do fill in your blank again. Right? Been there. You made those commitments, made those promises. You meant every word of it. And then a moment later, a day, a week, a month, a decade. Failure. Like Peter, you don't live up to your promises. Maybe the marriage you committed to till death do us part is over. Maybe the habit that you had uh, broken returns with a vengeance. Maybe you slip back into addiction or adultery. Maybe you had an abortion, abused your spouse, you stole, you lied, you cheated a friend, and all you feel like doing is running out and weeping bitterly. You tasted failure. We can really relate to Peter at this point, can't we? Well, I know I can. Because I admit it, I'm a failure. Anybody else a failure in here with me? 
yeah, lots of hands go up because truthfully, the Bible calls us all failures. Well, it uses the word sinners, right? As in all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For none is righteous, not even one. That's what a failure is. It's somebody who didn't live up to God's expectations. Peter just gets to be the poster child of failure, right? But that's not the end of the story. That's, see, that's the good news. It's not the end of the story. It's not the end of the story for Peter, and it's not the end of the story for us. Because we're failures, but, but the story's not over. And, and we need to hear that because a lot of times we are ready to just give up. We're ready to say, it's over. Uh, I'm done. I'm disqualified. There's no way that God is going to let me back in. But see, with Peter, he felt that way. And a couple days later, Easter morning, Jesus is raised from the dead. He appears to the disciples two times in the upper room. Chad talked about those occurrences last week. And then the third time that Jesus appears to the disciples, we see the restoration of, of Peter. Picture number two. The restoration of Peter. John chapter 21 uh, verses 15 through 19. I'm going to encourage you to turn over in your Bibles to John 21. Uh, if you have a Bible like mine, it's page 1154 or 1155. Uh, here's the background. Peter gave up. He gave up. I mean, he knew Jesus was raised from the dead, but he knew that his, betray his denial was so significant, he just figured Jesus could never really let him follow him again. It, you know, Jesus couldn't use him. And so Peter went back to fishing. That wasn't his hobby. He wasn't just out for a good time. That was his job. Remember, he was a fisherman. Jesus had said, come and follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And Peter left the boats. Well, he went back to the boats, went back to his work. So what do you need to do? Some of the other disciples went with him. And they're out there fishing all night on the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus shows up, works a miracle, gives them a whole bunch of fish, 153 if you have to know the number, and uh, freaks them all out and then fixes breakfast. That's kind of cool, isn't it? Hey, Jesus, uh, why don't you work out a miracle and let's have breakfast? That's what he does. He works a miracle and he fixes breakfast. And, and then uh, there's this awkward and wonderful conversation between Peter and Jesus. Let's listen into it. John 21, beginning in verse 15. It said, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Peter said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. And Jesus said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to Peter, follow me. Follow me. Full circle. It's where they began, and that's where they finished. Follow me. Now, for every one of us who has ever failed, I want to point out some things in this conversation. First of all, did you notice that Jesus directly confronts Peter's failure. That's uncomfortable, isn't it? But Jesus was face to face with him and, and he confronted his failure because he says, Peter, do you love me? How many times? And how many times did Peter deny Jesus? Yeah, three times. You think that was accidental? You think Jesus was just having an Alzheimer's moment? <laughs> like, did I already ask you that question? No, it's on purpose. Because he's wanting to peel away the layers of guilt and shame that Peter has experienced. All right? Because Peter failed miserably three times. And so three times Jesus affirms him. 
by confronting his failure and letting him know that it's not over. Eye to eye, face to face, nose to nose, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, you know I love you. And then Jesus says, feed my sheep. Feed my lambs, tend my lambs. See, Jesus wants Peter to know that he is completely and totally forgiven of everything that he's done. And so three times he goes down this road so that Peter gets the fact that he's forgiven and not only does Jesus forgive Peter completely, but he trusts him with responsibility. Did did you notice that? It's not just you're forgiven, now go sit over there in the corner like a good failure. It's Peter, I have a job for you. I, I want you to join me in what I've been doing. I want you to work with me. I want you to work for me. I want you to take care of people. Like I've been taking care of people. Isn't that cool? I mean, the poster child of failure, and here he is. Hey, I want you to take care of my sheep. Do you know what is so wonderful about grace? You know what's just so incredibly cool about grace? Everything. Everything. I mean, grace is God's trump card. You think about it, it wins out over everything. Mercy wins all the time. That's what the good news is. And, and, and you may sit here tonight and you may think, there's no way with my failures, with my you know, blunders, with my rebellion, that God could forgive me. There's no way that God would let me lead others or have influence for him. There's no way God would trust me with responsibility or allow me to serve him. And if you think that, like Peter, you're wrong. You're wrong. Because God wants you to know that you're forgiven. Now, your enemy, Satan, has a different plan. By the way, you know the word Satan means adversary? Adversary. It's because he's against you in everything. He's against you. God is for us. And Satan is against us. He's your adversary. Your enemy wants to rub your nose in the guilt and the shame of your failure. He wants to remind you of your failure constantly. That's why it pops into your head all the time. Because Satan wants to bring it up. Hey, let's go back and talk about this conversation again. Let's talk about how you failed again. Let's talk about how you broke that promise again. Let's talk about it again. He wants you to live wallowing in your failure. He wants you to own the identity of loser. But Jesus looks your failure straight in the eye and he asks, do you love me? So do you love him? Do you love him? Feed his sheep. Feed his sheep. Isn't isn't that what he said to to Peter? I I want you to understand tonight that God wants to restore your life. No matter where you've been, what you've done, how you failed, God wants to restore your life. He wants you to experience grace and mercy and forgiveness that does not quit. It is for you. So will you look Jesus in the eye and tell him that you love him? Will you receive the grace that he is offering to you? You know, so often we hear those words about forgiveness and, and, they, and we get them here, but they don't somehow get into our soul. And so Satan keeps winning in our lives because he keeps reminding us of the failure. So let's, let's try some. I'm going to do a little experiment with you guys and let's see if, how it works. Uh, uh, if it fails, that's okay because we're all failures anyway. So, uh, so make eye contact with somebody around you. Look him in the eye, because you know, that's what Jesus did, right? He looked somebody in the eye. He looked Peter in the eye. So make eye contact, and, and, and I want you to just, one, you guys take turns doing this, but one of you ask the question, do you love Jesus? And then after they answer, yes, because you know they will, because we're in church. <laughs> then, then I want you to look him in the eye still and say, you are forgiven. Because I want us to get this. Ready, set, go. Do you love Jesus? You're forgiven, man. You're forgiven. Isn't that cool? Hope you own it. Hope you know it. 
See, I, I love this because in, in both services so far, there's giggling going on. <laughs> and, and the reality is this. You might think, oh, it's just because we're awkwardly uncomfortable staring into somebody's eyes that we don't know. Um, and, and I saw a couple back there exchanging numbers. But um, <laughs> it's all right. Uh, and, and, uh, but see, here's the thing. When we experience the grace of God and we really understand the grace of God, it makes us laugh. It makes us rejoice. It makes us happy because we understand that all our sins are forgiven by Jesus. And he's not sitting there angry at us, but he's going to confront our sin and he's going to restore us to a place of responsibility. See, we don't have to live in failure. Jesus wants to restore your soul so that you can experience even more than just restoration. Because the third picture, the third snapshot of Peter's life that we see is the power of God in Peter. The power of God in Peter. Flip a page over to Acts chapter 2. Because literally in my Bible, it's a page. Acts chapter 2. Uh, it's about 40 days after the resurrection. And Jesus has ascended to heaven, uh, leaving the disciples with a promise and a challenge. He says, you will receive uh, power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And Jesus then ascended to heaven, and the followers are in Jerusalem. They're gathered together when God surprises them. They shouldn't have been surprised. Jesus had told them he's going to give them the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit falls on them. And uh, they go out from the room that they're praying in. And, uh, and all around Jerusalem, there are people from all over the world because it is a feast of tabernacles, the feast of booths. And, and so they're there, and these people start hearing the apostles and all the believers uh, talking to them about Jesus, about the good news, in their own native languages. And they're like, how are these people doing this? They're from Galilee. We can tell by their accents. Apparently Galilee had an accent like Georgia or something. And... Uh, <laughs> And so they hear them sharing in their own language. And, and then at that moment, Peter, the failure who has been restored by Jesus, steps into the power of God. Pick up Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 14. I'm going to read uh, parts of 14 through 41. Uh, not the whole thing, but go home tonight or tomorrow and read Acts chapter 2 and see what God does. It says, but Peter, verse 14, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. Skip over to verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up According to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Verse 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 41. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Wow. Wow. Peter, who weeks earlier had denied knowing who Jesus was to a servant girl, now stands in the public square in Jerusalem and proclaims at the top of his lungs that Jesus is alive, that he is Messiah, that you need to trust in him, that he alone can give you eternal life. And 3,000 people become followers of Jesus that day. Is that cool or what? Here was Peter, who was not just a failure, who was not just restored by God's grace, but now he has stepped into the power of God in his life. So it doesn't matter how you have failed God. God wants to restore your life so he can unleash his power in you. So that he can use you to influence your family, your children, your grandchildren. So he can use you to influence your friends, your coworkers, this community to follow Jesus Christ. 
Wouldn't you love to experience the power of Pentecost? Yeah, that'd be cool, wouldn't it? Wouldn't you like to see God work like that here in Lake Havasu City? See, some of you would. I would. And, and here's how I think God is going to do this. I'm just going to tell you, I, here's, here's a glimpse of what, what I think God is getting ready to do in our midst. Power of Pentecost. Because here's, here's the deal. There's 35 to 40,000 unchurched people here in Lake Havasu City. Okay, this is our mission field. These are the people that God has placed Calvary here to share the good news of Jesus Christ with. So 35 to 40,000, how are we going to reach them? Well, we're going to reach them a few at a time, but, but here's what I think is going to happen. We're going to see our own Pentecost this way. When we occupy the Sweetwater building, okay, we, we, we have more space, more parking, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we believe that in the first six months we're in that building, we're going to see 3,000 guests come to church. 3,000 guests. You go, wow, that's a great number, Pastor. Were well, you just making it up off the top of your head? <laughs> well, if I was, so what? <laughs> no, it's, you know, it's the number of Pentecost, but see, here's the deal. Here's how we get 3,000. And, and by the way, I'm not going to be the one who brings them. You are. Because here's the deal. We've been averaging about 1,500 people attending on a weekend at Calvary. 1,500 people. They know what that means? That means that each one of us simply brings two of our unchurched friends. Wow, that's it. Two of our unchurched friends. Each one of us brings two of our unchurched friends to come to a worship service in a span of six months when the building is new and people are like, oh, I'll come check out your church, sure. You guys are the ones who bless the schools, sure. You guys are the ones who serve the community, sure. I'll come visit with you. I'll come and check it out with you. And we get to share the good news of forgiveness in Jesus Christ with 3,000 people over a period of six months and a lot of them are gonna make Jesus their Savior and Lord. See, isn't that cool? That's how it can happen. See, you guys are clapping, but we have work to do. See, it's, it's, the idea is exciting, but it, it only happens if you and I step into the power of God that he's made available to us through the Holy Spirit. Because the same Holy Spirit who brought 3,000 people to faith in Jesus at the day of Pentecost is the Holy Spirit who indwells you and me because we're followers of Jesus Christ right now. That is a biblical reality. So we'll get to see the power of God in us and in our church and in this community if and only if we decide not to live in failure. If we decide to embrace the forgiveness and restoration of Jesus and if we ask God to use us to glorify him, then... We'll see the power of God in us. You will see the power of God in you. So which picture of Peter's life best describes your life right now? Are you living in failure? Are you experiencing restoration? Are you stepping into the power of God in your life? See, if you're not where you want to be, are you going to stay there? Or are you going to follow Jesus to the next picture? Let's pray together. Father, tonight we thank you for the way that you love us. Even in our failure, you don't give up on us. You want to redeem. You want to restore. You want to empower us to serve you. So, Lord, I pray right now for all of us in this room that we would sense your presence and your power in our lives. We would know your mercy and your forgiveness completely. And, God, that you would already begin burning into our minds the two people that you want to use us to lead to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. God, you know we don't have to wait till next year. We can start being your instruments of power right now in the lives of those around us. So we commit ourselves to you, our great God who is for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship our God together.